My guest today is Gail Fritter. Gail, how are you today? Great. Uh, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been a long time since we've spoken, my friend. And uh, I know that um, when last time you were on the show, you were we talked about your product Post Sharp, which you've had for many, many years and still have. But I understand you have a new product as well. Yes. Um, because Rosalind is becoming uh, more and more powerful and extensible. So three, four years ago, Microsoft came with the source generators and I told to myself, it is, it is the moment to, to do a new product based on Roslyn and not based on, on uh, MSIL uh, transformation. Well, back, back in the time, back in 2004, the C sharp compiler was closed source. It was a C plus right. plus code base and the challenge that that we had at this moment was, um, well, in C sharp, you had a lot of boilerplate code that you had to write, um, and to, and to generate this, this like boilerplate code. Uh, first quick to define boilerplate code. Yeah. So boilerplate code is, it's a term that comes from the legal jargon. You know, it's when you have a contract, you have all these things that always gets repeated, like, you know, the, the cancellation in clothes and uh, like, uh, well, all these things. And so um, it came to software engineering as the code that you need to repeat in every every method or in every, every class. Uh, the Hello World example for boilerplate code is, is, is logging. You may have a requirement mm. that you need to lock every public method in this namespace. And um, the problem is that the C sharp language doesn't have a construct that allows you to say for each public method in this namespace, add logging. Mm. Um, so logging is a very typical example, a bit, a bit boring. Another extremely typical example is the implementation of notify property changed. Because if mm. you think about how you implement this interface, um, well, it's not enough just to add the event. You also need to go into and to edit all property setters to compare the new value with the old value. And if the value is different, you raise the, the event. So you can describe to, to your colleague how to implement the, the interface. You can create an algorithm to, to implement these, uh, these patterns, hmm. but you cannot express this algorithm in C sharp because the compiler doesn't allow for that. And so back, back in 2004, uh, I said, okay, the compiler does not allow for that. So we are going to read the MSIL, transform it and do this for each method, do that inject all the code that we need and um, and compile it back. So this was in 2004. And um, when Roslyn came with, um, with um, source generators, so I thought it was the time to do, to do a, a new product that would be based on Roslyn and not on not on MSIL transformation. So this, mm. this became Metalama. It was quite a journey. And we did a, a soft launch last May. So now it is stable and most, most problems have been fixed. And uh, that's, that's what we are working on now and since, since the last years. Oh, okay. So it, years. it's, um, it's generating um, code for you, boilerplate code for you. That's the idea, right? Um, yes. And, uh, and doing it for a whole set of, uh, you know, like everything in a namespace, for example, the example that you gave. Yeah, there are two, there are two ways that you would do that typically, you know, one, one way would, you would hand pick the targets with the custom attribute. So, okay, this, this, this class needs, needs a notify property change pattern or mm. 
this class needs needs a uh, change tracking and mm. then you can quantify this and you, and you say you you actually do a link query over your code ah. and you say for 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 all public namespaces uh, for all public classes uh, that implement this interface do this oh wow so there are these two ways there is a third way where you can have aspect inheritance for instance if the base class implements notify property change of course or hmm. uh, all derived classes should also uh, also implement the same interface and we have the same so um, the the typical problems that are that that generate a lot of boilerplate code. Um, so I named plugging and uh, and native property change are two the two examples. You have in general uh, all profiling and and uh, telemetry. I collecting collecting this this information. Um, object model thing. So how do you generate uh, two string? Like it's also mm -hmm. body replayed code. How do you generate um, deep cloning, for instance? You can think mm -hmm. of a lot of patterns that you would like to be able to to code the implementation, but you can't because because the C sharp language is is limited. Okay. So, so MetaLama is a tool that allows you to do that, not only to uh, uh, add logging, for example, but actually to implement a pattern. Yes, the class. idea is that is that you implement a pattern, that you, or to be exact, you implement a pattern using one or or many aspects. So, um, so an aspect. This comes from the theory um, of of aspect oriented programming. This is a that's that's a theory that that was developed in the nineties. It, it was badly named. I, I think <laughs> the name should not have been something oriented. But um, the idea is that you create an aspect, and an aspect is something, a class, uh, in MetaLama and in PostSharp it executes at compile time. So within the compiler or within the IDE, and it does three things. It can um, advice code that means provide transformations for instance implementing an interface overwriting properties or uh, introducing new methods and so on so so advising code is one thing the second thing is to report errors in diagnostics so you can say uh, for instance i cannot add logging to to this to this class because there should be a logger uh, service in the class and and uh, the aspect chooses not to pull the logger, but to require it to be present. That would be a design choice. Design choice, mm -hmm. um, and this is this is this is quite an important point. When you when you write an aspect, you can consider that you are writing a component that other people will use, and it's like when you write object oriented code, your your code needs to check that it is called in the with the right conditions and the right parameters. So, so if you do an aspect that say requires a static method and doesn't work on instance method, so you would you would add this precondition to the aspect, test it. So the third thing that an aspect can do is to is to suggest a refactoring. So, for instance, you can you can uh, suggest a refactoring. Uh, well, one example is that if you have an automatic two string and you want to change it to a manual two string, but you don't want the user to write the code that has been generated manual uh, automatically, you would you would suggest the refactoring. So that when the user clicks on, you know, the refactoring menu, and change to string to uh, to source code, um, it well the the IDE the IDE would do that. The, 
what's, what's important to understand here is that the aspect works within the compiler. So your source code remains clear, clean of any boilerplate. This is, this is the goal. So when you, when you create a refactoring out of an aspect, you are actually generating source code, which is then not the ultimate goal because it is still boilerplate code. But in some cases, it can, it can, it can increase your productivity and uh, um, make things better for the, for the developers, even if the, the, the best scenario would be to generate it on the fly. So we have these three, these three abilities of an aspect. Um, and in Metalama, we have a new concept. And this is the concept of a fabric. And um, a fabric is it's a method where um, it, it's a class that executes at compile time and at design time in the IDE. And that is uh, th that can select the namespace, the types, and so on. And Add the at the aspects. So we have these two these two concepts. Okay. Well, help me understand uh, if if I'm a developer and I'm working with Metalama, what is that experience like? Am I writing C sharp code? Am I configuring creating config files? What's what needs That's to happen? That's totally for me? C sharp. Everything's it's, in C sharp. Is, okay. It is totally C sharp. So we designed a a dialect of C-sharp that is 100% C-sharp compatible. We call this T-sharp because it is for templates. Mm. And the magic is that within one method, you have some code that executes at build time and some code that represents runtime code and will be injected as, as it. So for instance, inside your code template that, that, that you will then apply to a method, you could have a loop like for each parameter do this, you know, you could do for each parameter and then con uh, console write line. Then you do uh, parameter.name, which is a build time expression. Is this going to be evaluated at build time? And then mm -hmm. you have parameter.value, which is going to be at evaluated runtime. at runtime. It's going to be replaced by the name of the parameter. Mm -hmm. So the experience is completely, completely, uh, C sharp, um, and the surprising part is that inside the same project and indeed inside the same method, you could have code that is build time code and runtime code. And if you think about that, it's very similar to to Blazor, because you you have a meta language which is C sharp in Blazor, and then you okay. have a output language which is HTML. Right. But the difference is that with T sharp, the input language and the, and the output language are the same. It is C sharp to mm. C sharp template, completely oh, without any markup. Interesting. Uh, and then, um, how do we, are, so these these templates they just become part of of my solution? Right? They're checked into source code along with the rest of yes. the solution. It's a, what a separate project, I assume, is probably a good practice. That depends. Um, if you want your your aspects to be re reusable, you would uh, put that in a separate project. But mm. sometimes the aspects need to have they need to have a knowledge about the current project because they would reference types of the current project. Mm. So okay. in this case, it makes sense to have to have the the aspects in the same project. Um, Generally, you would not specifically uh, move your aspects to a to a separate project because the typically you would have your aspects just next to the class that needs it. I or, see. Okay. Um, I, no, that was not the the right way to to say that. But suppose that you create an interface. Um, or a base class and change tracked object. This would be your base class with a lot of facilities. And then you create, you add an aspect to this base type, an inheritable aspect that would be change tracking aspect. And, and all classes that that derived from your base entity would need to, to have this aspect. So typically you would have the, 
the base class and the aspect in the same project. It would not be a, a reason to do things differently. Okay. Um, and when uh, developers work with this, are, do you have your own IDE or is this a plugin for other IDEs like Visual Studio and v VS Code? Well, the, f the first level of experience, it is just C Sharp. So you can use VS Code and it's just going to work. And you can use is there anything special or... I need to, is there anything like an extension I need to add to VS Code in order for this to work or is it just set a reference no, the, that it works? The core services are going to work with 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 any IDE and even without an IDE, uh, even with uh, VI. Uh, is, now is we there have a new, we... NuGet package I need to? Yeah, exactly. So this is a set of NuGet packages. I see. Okay. Because because it integrates with with the standard Roslyn extension points like analyzers and source generators. Now to to enhance the development experience, we have. We have a Visual Studio extension, and it mm. adds uh, syntax highlighting for aspects. Um, uh, aspect diff that means that you can you can compare your source code with uh, generated code. Um, code length integration you can see that there is an aspect on your method even if you do not see that from source code because there is no custom attribute but you see that uh, from code mm. lens. So these are these are additional services, but the whole the core feature they work just thanks to to NuGet. Uh, okay. Well, how does the compiler know what to do at build time? Is there something special I need to configure for that, or does it just happen? Oh, it's completely special. We fork Roslyn. We have ah. we have our own fork of Roslyn. We call that Metalama compiler. It is it is an open source project. So you can go and use Metalama compiler for for any other project. Um, and Metalama compiler so is a fork of Roslyn that has an extension point. It's called iSource Transformer, and the input is a compilation, and the output is another compilation. Mm. So you can you can do any transformation you want. Which is very complex. It's very complex, but this is this is the new entry point. We we had to add a new entry point to uh, to Roslyn because Roslyn doesn't allow you to change the code uh, during compilation. So this is what happens during compilation. But at design time, when when you are writing code, we are not using the the Roslyn fork because it's just impossible to to change. Uh, and instead, we are using the standard extension points, analyzers, source generators, code fix providers. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it sounds like when when I go into Visual Studio, I hit build, it rather than calling the default builder, it's going to default call your fork of Roslyn to yes, do the compilation. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. Interesting. Um, this is... This is good information. As uh, you, you said, you said it's, it went to beta last year, and it's uh, is it in general release yet? What's the yes? What's no, the it is. Uh, it it was generally available on May of last year. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So now it is it is stable. We didn't do a big party and big launch because uh, we're careful, and now it has been out in the wild for. Uh, more than half a year, you know. Eight yeah. Months. Well, well so, once my once my tens of viewers watch this episode, you'll probably yes. have a phone call pour in, <laughs> and maybe a card and a letter. <laughs> yes, yes. So you can you can reach me on Slack when you when you go to our website. You will you will see a link. Oh, what, to is, what is your website? Postsharp.net. Slash Metalama. Well, you can Google Metalama, and you will, oh, you will put it get in the show there. Also. Yes. So you can you can find me and uh, the rest of the of the development team on Slack. We will mm -hmm. answer questions. We right. have uh, quite a complete documentation with a lot of uh, of tutorials, of video tutorials. Um, does this, exactly. I, everything you described yes. here, I think, uh, 
it also happened in your PostSharp product. Is this basically the next version of PostSharp or, or is PostSharp, will that continue to live as a separate product? Both, both are true. Uh, PostSharp continues to live as a separate product, but we stopped adding features. So we are in, uh, in maintenance mode with PostSharp. We are, we are still supporting users and we are still adding support for the new platforms. But when there is something that is too difficult to do in the new CHR features, um, yeah, so we, we are not going to, to, to make a big effort. Okay. Uh, and Metalema on the other side supports all, uh, all features. And this is where we are doing most, most invest, uh, most investments. So generally post sharp users, uh, these are rather, rather old projects now. Okay. Um, and so we continue supporting them. There is no fear to have uh, All right. with that. So if you're, if you're already using PostSharp, it's okay to keep using it for the foreseeable future. If you're new and you're not using either of these, you'd rather people, uh, they do themselves a favor by looking at Metalama rather than PostSharp. That's where all the new development will be going. Yes, definitively. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know this is a big product that does a lot more than this. Can you just really quickly rattle off other features of Metalama besides the boilerplate code? Well, the first, uh, the first we talked about is, is boilerplate code uh, reduction. And the second big feature is um, code validation. So the, the objective is to, is to find architecture erosion. And architecture erosion happens when you have some concept of the architecture, you may have a documentation and UML diagrams, you may have uh, some selection of design patterns that you want to use. You may have coding guidelines, but they are in text. It's not executable. So, and, and because it is not executable, you have the well, it needs to be to be checked manually during during code during code reviews, and of course it is time consuming and you have sure. the broken broken window syndrome. Somebody doesn't follow some rule, it is overlooked in a code review, or we get lenient. And over time, the the quality of the code declines. Yep. So I think it was you a have pragmatic a pragmatic programmer who introduced the broken window concept. <laughs> yeah. So you have a lot of tools on the market that checks the quality of the code against uh, well-known rules, you know, like right. formatting or um, some very specific design patterns or implementation patterns, like how mm. to implement eye disposable property, there are conventions. And a lot of these conventions are common to all .NET developers. And there are hundreds of resin analyzers to make sure that your code complies to, to these best practices. But what's missing is the, is the ability to test your code about your own conventions and mm -hmm. the, um, the rules of your team or, or your project, not the ones of the, of the global community. So for this, basically you have, you have three options. Um, one is to, to use uh, architecture unit test an architecture unit test or test that you would that would verify your code. So you are running unit tests, but not against uh, data, but against metadata about against your code. There is one uh, one framework that you can look at for that. It is NetArch Test. And it allows you to uh, well it has a fluent API to express these constraints uh, as unit test. So with Metalama, we do something similar, but differently. And the difference is that it becomes integrated within the IDE. So instead of being, being integrated with the test runner, you actually see uh, red squiggles when you, when you have an architecture mm, nice. violation. 
Uh, that's very cool. Um, so this is, we're just about at time. What's, uh, you, we mentioned postsharp.net slash metalama. Are there other sources, online sources you can point people to that are just getting started with this? Oh, the best is to get started from there. Then mm -hmm. you will go to the, to the documentation. We have an online sandbox. So you can, you can see from the documentation, you can look at the samples. You can, you can try it online without installing anything. We nice. have a, we have a Slack channel you will find from the support channels and videos. You will find everything from this pointer. Excellent. Well, Gail, thank you so much for your time. This has been really educational. And thank you, you for day. having me, David. David. TFS is dead, right? Team Foundation Services is dead. So long live to long life to technology French and and Scotch as the new TFS. Technology French and Scotch. <laughs>